Welcome to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. He is back. Anthony Portentino, you know him well. He served six years in the California State Assembly. He recently retired as a result of term limits. But guess what? He is still extremely busy serving our state in so many different ways. And sir, congratulations again on a successful six years. I do want to ask you about one of your recent appointments to the California Film Commission. You represented uh, significant portions of the San Gabriel Valley, Southern California, and those areas are so reliant in so many ways on the right. entertainment industry. You worked in the entertainment industry yourself. Right. What can you tell us about the Film Commission? Well, obviously we all know that the film entertainment industry is a core business for Los Angeles County, for the state of California. Mm -hmm. It's part of the golden dream and the luster of why so many of us move here, myself included. From I came New from New Jersey. Right. Um, and it's an important part of the economy. And so the legislature has passed a number of tax incentives, in my opinion, not enough, but a start. Uh, the Film Commission administers those tax incentives as a lottery system. And, and let's talk about those tax incentives because in some ways they're controversial. There's this whole notion that if you give an incentive to a corporation, it's corporate welfare. Right. And why should we be giving Hollywood Studios incentives when their CEOs are making $50 million a year or whatever it may be? I well, this is the one incentive that is the least controversial because it really is about middle class jobs. The studios are going to take their production to whatever state gives them the best opportunity. And for California, these are middle class jobs with health care, with benefits that are part of the economy. The tax incentive itself is also extremely well crafted in that it has accountability measures. Mm. Where, where the state has gotten into trouble is those you know, 3 a.m. deals to close the budget where they do tax incentives and they forbid the public from knowing who gets them. Hmm. By the way, there are tax incentives where the public is forbidden to know which companies actually get them. In this case, you actually have to make the movie, create the jobs, and then you get the, the benefit after the fact. And so that accountability makes us special. And as we speak today, there's kind of a metaphor brewing surrounding The Tonight Show right. with Jay Leno. You know, there are rumors that he may be departing. Right. The successor would be Jimmy Fallon, and they could take that show to New York. That would be terrible for Burbank. It would be terrible for... Uh, the California economy and just the the image of our great state. So, so I'm hoping they would reconsider that. Um, but, know, I'm just hoping that yeah, they would. But this know. is an example of what can California do? What can the Film Commission do to remind this industry that this is where your home is? Don't go to New York. Don't go to North Carolina. Don't go to Louisiana. Don't go to Toronto. Don't go to Vancouver. Stay home. Well, part of it is the advocacy. Part of it is the talent aspect. I mean, you know, the more talent, the more stars and directors who want to stay home, that helps. The business climate, uh, improving the business climate, the tax incentives, all of that works in concert. Making you know, the state property and the state parks and the state lands mm -hmm. film friendly. I actually just took a call last week from uh, somebody who was working on a film and the location manager uh, was working with a local city and was working on getting signatures and they had a deadline to get it in and I called the city manager uh, to make sure that, you know, sure. this was, you know, properly uh, Kosher. addressed right. and so they could have their prep days and film. Um, so there's all of those little things but work in concert. But getting back to, you know, a sh sometimes a show leaves because the talent wants to be in another city. Which I understand. And that's a different issue. It is. Um, but all of that has to be worked together. And we as a legislature, we as a, as a state have to say this is a priority. And there's been a hesitancy over the years to do that. But over the last year or two, we have seen some incentives pass. Right. When Governor Schwarzenegger was in office, some small measures passed, but right. then he was being targeted with the notion, oh, you're a Hollywood actor, you're just right. favoring your friends. So in some ways, his celebrity backfired or no? Well, the problem is the philosophical nature of incentive. There are some people who don't look at economic development, creating mm -hmm. more revenue as an important thing. They look at the tax incentive as taking away from something else. What I tried to do while I was there is get us to change the way we budget and actually score the economic development. We know that the first round of tax incentives created over a billion dollars of economic development for the state. It was a good investment. Which, which incentives? Are the first 300 million. This passed under the Schwarzenegger right. administration? Mm -hmm. the, I mean, that generated over a billion dollars of benefit mm -hmm. to the state. So it's part of it is selling the, 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 the facts, 
that it's an investment. I mean, if you look at the, the, the economy, there's only three things you can do with it. You can make it bigger by growing it. You can put more into it or you can take something out of it. And we don't spend enough time focusing on growing the economy, and that's why the incentive is a good thing. So do you believe we need to create more incentives? Absolutely, we need to do more. Um, and being playing my role on the Film Commission is gonna give me an opportunity to do that. You've taken another position. Uh, we all know the Jess Unruh Institute at the University of Southern California. It's very well regarded. The Institute regarded. of Politics. The Institute of Politics, very well regarded. and. Surprisingly, you're a visiting fellow. I well, just, you know, I here just, I am a kid from New exactly. Jersey, and now I get to be an academic. Exactly. So, talk. I was thinking of getting a pipe and a coffee mug and walking, in maybe a, you know, a Might cardigan well. sweater or I something. I think it fits. You could pull yeah. it off. But talk to me about that. I'm an adjunct professor one night a week at Whittier College, uh -huh. and uh, I get a, a real joy out of teaching. I'm sure you. The, students will love you. Well, it's been one of my favorite things being an elected uh, official is I've gotten to go into a lot of classrooms and been invited to speak at both mm -hmm. the college level, the high school level um, for the last decade. And so I really enjoyed it. Um, in this case, uh, Dan Schnur, who is the director of the Unruh Institute. A Republican. Uh, I'm a moderate Republican, a, a guy who's been around. And I around. say that just because you're a, Demo a well-known Democrat. You know, he's been around and he's mm -hmm. seen the political process from the inside, the good, the and bad, and the ugly of it. he's extremely well respected. Uh, well respected, and you know, lo mm -hmm. and behold, he followed my sort of fight for transparency and good right. government reform and um, through you know, networking, right. we got hooked up and he uh, asked me to join the uh, Unruh Institute as a visiting fellow. So what does uh, that mean? What are you going to be doing? Well, I'm going to be focusing on reform, pu pushing government reform from an academic perspective, um, hopefully inspiring young people to go into public service. We're going to be teaching a class right. in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, Called? They, uh, we're, it's going to be team taught myself, uh, Dan and Tony Strickland. My Tony aspect, Strickland, yeah, Tony State Stick Senator. My aspect is going to be on values-based leadership. You know, it's not about your party; it's about your beliefs. What do you believe in? If you believe in it and you lead from your beliefs, you're going to do well. If you don't believe in it, and of course we have a lot of that, where you know the public doesn't think folks believe in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be talking about this concept of values-based leadership, and then I'm also going to be working with the. The, the felt the internship program mm. and trying to get more young people involved in pro, um, very successful internship opportunities where they can be mentored by to today's leaders so they can be tomorrow's leaders. I want to tell you a, a brief story. I recently went to an event and Carl Rove spoke, of all people. Carl Rove. I didn't go to that uh, one. Yeah, but I got to tell you, I don't care what you say, uh, what you think about his politics, brilliant, you know, a thinker mm -hmm. and, and tremendous influence on um, this nation. He told a story that he, his first job was as an intern in Texas right. somewhere, and he said one of his happiest moments was calling his boss, the boss who, where he had been the intern, to offer him the position as ambassador to Belgium because he, he had been President there, right. Bush's uh, senior advisor. I mean, think about that. Right. Well, it's important. Internships matter. Yeah, well, it matters how you start your journey. Do you start your journey being mentored by honorable, talented, you know, mentors or by folks that you don't necessarily want to be mentored or taught life lessons from people that aren't really teaching you the good life lessons? Uh, we want to make sure that tomorrow's leaders get those I good to lessons tell you, today. I interned in college um, on a senatorial campaign in 1986 mm -hmm. and that put me on a path toward involvement in the political process. No wonder why am. you like politics uh, I so mean, it's much. from that day, but honestly, I'm, and I still am in touch with those people, mm -hmm. and it's funny, I recently uh, was an MC, it's actually a few years back now, an MC of the, um, the administering the oath to Mark Ridley Thomas when he became supervisor, and I looked out in the audience, and I was the MC, and there was my boss when I was an intern, wow. and it was one of my happiest moments to see her smiling back at me. Well, you know you do something right when your interns continue to have right. contact with you. And I know mine check in with me no doubt. Uh, throughout the years. A couple are in law school. It's all good. Oh, no. His name is Anthony Portentino, former member of the California State Assembly, now on the California Film Commission, at the Unruh Institute, and so much more. I'm Brian Palmer, and it's this, this Charter California Edition. How many states ban their state legislators from political fundraising while their state legislators are in session? Two, seven, 11, or 15.
15 states, including Texas and Florida, have passed rules banning political contributions while their state legislators are in session. Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined again by Fred Sykes. He's a council member in West Covina. And sir, you've been on our program before and you've been singing the same song very clearly, very loudly, very methodically and melodically. And that is you have tremendous concerns about the way the city council is operating and whether the best interests of the people are being placed at a premium value. Is that a fair assessment? It concerns me, uh, their outlook, their philosophical approach to uh, our governance. Um, but um, the cry that I've been giving out has mainly been to the people for the people. It, to, it to let them know that for us to have a, a, the city we want, they need to be involved. And so it becomes a simple matter of the, we have the government we have because it's the government we deserve it, based on how we have behaved. You haven't been involved. Right, very low voter turnout. Right. So Another uh, challenge that West Covina <clears throat> faces is that, how many residents do you have, about 150,000? Oh, I so, wish. It's oh. only 112. Well, that's still a lot. I mean, that's a, not a that's small city. That's a good city. number. That's not a small city. Especially when they're not involved. It's, uh, and you uh, elect at large. You at don't large elect elections. by district. That's correct. And as a result, it can be very costly to run citywide. That's, that's correct. Certain communities may be disparately impacted, disenfranchised, disenfranchised left out, disregarded. And that's what you feel as if is happening. That's what brought me to the forefront. It's not about feel. I know because I've lived there for since 1978. Mm -hmm. And when I moved there, I, I, uh, I grew up in an area, watched Willowbrook and Compton. Mm. And there, all those things that I see happening uh, to West Covina happened there. So kids, in order to have a nice, beautiful park, certain parts of town, they get on the bus to go find a park to play in. And when I moved to West Covina, we had tons of open green spaces. And when I wasn't paying attention between 1978 to 2006, uh, all of a sudden uh, that green space and open space dwindled along with some other things that occurred. So let's talk about why you believe this is happening. Get your side of the story. And it focuses upon uh, individuals on the city council and your personal view that their interests are more aligned with certain corporate entities as opposed to the people. That's mainly, again, is fueled by the people in that it is much easier to um, run and, and succeed at getting a seat when you have participation of the community because they vote. Uh, and, and so when you have uh, uh, folks that aren't doing their part, when they aren't being good citizens by being involved, um, we have uh, 112,000 people. We have, uh, on the average, we have about 50,000 registered. And, and then it only took me 3,200. Mm -hmm. The lead vote getter who's been in for 22 years got 3,600 votes. So what does that tell you? Somebody's not voting. A lot of somebodies. And so that's where the, that's where the first fault lies. Now, the problem is, is that when you run with that at-large at election, you really hit the mm -hmm. nail on the head. It, financially, it is, it is very, quite costly to run 17 square miles. And when you have this lack of participation, you're trying to dig those votes out from wherever you can. And then when you're competing against folks that are entrenched, that have, uh, their, 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 the city uh, reps there have been purchased away. Their, their ability to speak and their desire to speak for the people has been purchased away by the corporate interests because that's who funds their campaign. Well, let's talk about so that. So that's the bottom line. The land developers and, of course, Athens. Um, Which is a trash, trash company. service company. Right. But recently, uh, Michael Tui, who had served on the city council for many years, was elected to a water board. Yes. So he had to resign. And there was a decision that had to be made. How yes. are we going to fill his seat? Yes. A couple of options. You could uh, appoint within the city council, yes. or you could hold an election. Yes. I know recently there had been similar situations, Riverside, for example, San Luis Obispo, and there were decisions made to hold elections. What happened in West Covina? You do have an option according to the law, and one of them is to replace it with by way of elections, but financially, we knew that that's uh, a, a great encumbrance for us. In, even in if it was consolidated with another election, even if you did a mail-in ballot, 
it was even you sensed that it would be too costly. Even I voted to to appoint um, just because of the way our finances are, and we cannot afford to to spend money. Um, we had to, we had to, we have to be as frugal as we can, and so the best way looking at that in order to keep the services uh, at at a, at a uh, um, comfortable level for the residents, uh, the best option was to appoint. We do have an election coming up in November. So um, you couldn't leave the seat open for that long, in your view? I felt that uh, for the people, uh, having put someone in place that's going to speak for the people was the best option, but that didn't happen. Now, the person who was appointed, his name is Andrew McIntyre, is he required to run in November? He's not required to run. He's and, filling a term. And the thing uh, that I <clears throat> also want to bring to, to point here is that um, the seat was vacated by a certain council member mm -hmm. that um, did have um, a contract as a land as a consultant for land developers. And so he worked, in essence, for uh, the person that, that was voted in. And uh, the people who voted for, for him, I didn't vote for the gentleman just because I know from uh, what I've seen in the past, uh, from his history of what, what they've developed and so forth, uh, and what they allowed in the way of variances. And those variances were given by council members. And you ask, well, why are they responding that way? Why, why are they not adhering to what the people are asking? And you look and see the 460 forms bear out how p people get elected. And, and 460 those forms are disclosure forms? Disclosure forms are in your campaign finances. So in your view, the person that was appointed, Andrew McIntyre, um, will be required to recuse himself. I feel too often. F did Mr. Tui, as an example, who worked <clears throat> for Mr. McIntyre, recuse himself often? Yes. And it was, uh, it's, it's a necessary part of, a, of avoiding being incarcerated because you're not supposed to be voted in and then uh, represent uh, a company's interest that you're now having to do business with that's gonna, it's gonna pay you. It's gonna give you direct benefits uh, to that company getting uh, um, purchase of the land and developing so it. So they, they are recusing uh, themselves though. I mean, yes, you they can't do. argue that, th that it's, I mean, they're taking the necessary ethical steps, putting up those walls to prevent right to prevent themselves from being caught in the quandary of representing two, two different entities at the same time. Uh, however, uh, when, when you are um, elected, or in this case uh, appointed, to speak for the people, when you recuse yourself and you're leaving the, the dais, you're, you're disqualifying yourself and you're no longer doing what you put there so for. So what's the answer? I mean, you people. obviously are distressed by this scenario. The best answer would be to get the public involved so that when they vote, because uh, somehow we seem to have forgotten the constituents, and this is not just uh, West Covina, but I definitely want to speak to West Covina. Mm -hmm. That's my focus. But you can see it uh, all the way from local to, to the uh, federal level uh, all around the United States that we have lost one little basic thing, and that's that when you vote for people, you vote, you're voting because uh, it's about trust. And um, oftentimes when you don't vote, you're leaving that choice of, um, of uh, someone selecting them by way of but, who they trust but, but this is a problem. to other people. But this is a problem. I think about, for example, in Los Angeles. They recently held a mayoral election. Yes. I guess when all the votes were counted, 20% voter turnout. Right. Los Angeles. Yes. Huge city. Absolutely. Same so problem. So where do we go from here? Well, I try not to give up, and that's why you see me here oftentimes. As you said, I've been, I've been louding out to the community. <laughs> Let's get involved. We're risking um, the quality of our lives, the value of our property. Um, we need to figure out just to spend a little a time in one, seeing every now and then what's going on with your government, and two, when you go to vote, learn to vote by examination. Vote because you vet, examine, check their history, and for sure look for integrity, and vote for those folks because you trust them. And, and that's why you vote, and that's how you vote. Fred Sykes, thanks for joining us. My name is Brad Palmer. This is Charter California Edition. 
Which is the last city to have incorporated in Los Angeles County? Calabasas, Diamond Bar, Malibu, or Santa Clarita? Calabasas is the newest city in the Los Angeles County, having incorporated on April 5th, 1991. Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest is Damien Sojourner. He is a professor at Scripps College specializing in Africana studies, which is what? It's a study of the African diaspora. So diaspora. That, that so it's not the African continent. It's Africans living outside of the African continent. Including, including the continent as well. Oh, as well. Yeah. Okay. So both the routes and the routes going well back, stated. back and well forth. Well stated. Right. Now, when you were getting your PhD, you did something that I think is just so incredibly interesting. You served as a substitute teacher in a high school called Southeast County High School, and you observed a trend that it's hard to deny is just ugly. Right. Talk right. to us about it. What, what I was looking at was the relationship between schools and prisons. And I, I should say that Southeast County is a pseudonym, because there is actually a Southeast County school, but I mean, there there's you have a, it. But it, that's not the name of the, okay. of the school. So Thank it's you. A, pseudonym okay. uh, for the school. So the relationship between schools and prisons, and in particular, what I was trying to figure out was, there's a body of literature called the School to Prison Pipeline. Yes. And uh, what I was seeing was more that it was not necessarily a pipeline, so that students weren't being funneled out from uh, schools into prison, but rather the school itself was functioning as a prison. Oh my. And what I mean by that is that the technologies of control that, were, that, that, we, that we commonly think of as in place in prison are already in place in uh, public education. So the, the mapping of the school uh, through fences and gates, things of that nature, um, the level of security and policing uh, in terms of there was multiple, there, there, were, there were staff members who were assigned to be sort of security, but then you had uh, sheriffs that were around school as well. So all these things uh, that we don't necessarily associate with schools uh, per se uh, were commonly found within the, in the school, or what to say what we don't think of as education, or shouldn't think of as and education. And what's interesting is in the wake of the Newtown shootings, for example, there seems to be at some level a move to further securitize public school campuses. Right. What, what's your sense? I think we should have a moment of pause and really just look at the history of it. And what I mean by that is that all the research indicates, for example, the D.A.R.E. program, the D.A.R.E. to keep drugs out of right. um, schools program, which put a lot of police in schools. What was found is that actually the drug usage rate went up after that program was put in place. Why? A lot of it is because when you put an authority figure within a classroom, mm -hmm. for example, you're going to have resistance. Right. Because that's what... Kids that's what do. kids do. Exactly, if you're told not to do something, in the manner of what they told not to do something, as opposed to having an actual like, conversation and get engagement about what's going on besides the aspect of drugs. Why are kids utilizing drugs in the first place? But you also look specifically at the young black male. Right. And how the young black male was uh, being educated, how authority figures, teachers, administration, how they were interacting with this young black male high school student. Right, right. What did you find? In particular, what I found was that um, a lot of emphasis was placed on the realm of sports, uh, football and basketball for particular reasons. And the type of construction of masculinity was very dangerous in this way. That it was very uh, like a man goes to war. It was all these militaristic and violent type of- uh, Metaphors. Exactly, of, of what a man was. Which only works in a very particular set of circumstances on the, the playing field or on the basketball court. Once you leave this and under that control and under those very limited uh, s set of uh, right. sort of things that happen, then you have problems. If you display that same type of aggressive behavior outside of that realm, you're criminalized as being deviant, violent, so on and so forth. And so you see that happening and you wonder, well, where are, where are these things coming from? Where? So for example, what happened in Steubenville, Ohio? Right. Uh, um, so it Remind was, us. Uh, so in Super Bowl, the gang rape. Exactly, mm -hmm. and uh, there was two young men who were found guilty right. recently. Well, the football coach knew about the whole thing that was going on, and he was trying to brush it away. And so this uh, sports has a lot to do. Athletics has a uh, lot to do. Boys will be boys. Exactly. But but I focus specifically on the young black male, right? Because you know w we look at statistics, and, and the numbers are th th they break your heart when you think about graduation rates for young black males, right, right. Um, th they're dropping. Right. They're not increasing. Exactly. Um, exactly. What did you learn? I mean, 
in addition to these kind of sports metaphors, what else was happening? There's a complete disregard for the intelligence of, of black males on one hand, in terms of the, th the, the thinking is already that they're not smart, not intelligent. And so when you have that thought process, that's going to carry on. So by, by the time I got to high school, this was already baggage that came with them from middle school. What about school. black females? How are they treated? So this, it's, uh, there wasn't that much of a uh, distinction necessarily. It was just that black males were doing worse than black females, but black females weren't doing that much better. But were they males. treated differently vis-a-vis their non-black counterparts. I mean, I know well, we've talked about this on this program, the whole notion that, you know, girls aren't good in science and math. And so, of course, I don't believe that, but that's this kind of metaphor. Mm -hmm. Is Were you saying that kind of compounded with the black female? I think there's like a, there's a difference that's at play. And that difference is, of course, the social construction of gender and how that mm -hmm. played out. So they weren't taught in the same ways to be necessarily violent, so on and so forth, but there was a lot at play in terms of how they were treated as young women on one hand, but the, a lot of the black women that were there were extremely poor and impoverished. Mm. And when you have that, that uh, combination, it's, it's a lack of access and power to sort of uh, make waves and make changes. And also you're very vulnerable at the same time. Um, and so what I mean by that was, is that uh, the ways in which if black women were to act out in particular ways, they were treated as loud, obnoxious, so on and so forth. When really, the stereotype. Exactly, exactly. I want to ask you about a truancy program that has been adopted in Los Angeles County. I actually spoke with one of your students about it um, maybe a year ago or so. I think her name was Christy Hernandez. That's right, that's right. And it became, to my eyes, a bit disturbing how this truancy program, as well intentioned as it may have been, was being implemented. Why don't you talk to us about that truancy program? So the truancy program starts in the, the 1990s, actually right around it's at the same time as the, the D.A.R.E. program. Mm. And it comes out of the, um, the omnibus, I have all things, uh, drug act, because mm -hmm. uh, it was a provision that was put in place that uh, allowed the state to prosecute parents if in fact their students were, their, their children were, were not in sure. school. I think maybe in some regard, it was well-intentioned, but the, the, the finding out years later, what we can see is that it was aimed completely at black and, and Latino students. And wh what I mean by that is that of all the tickets that have been called thus far, something like over 85% have been issued out to black and And Latino. part of that is because of the way those students and their communities have developed around their local schools. There are transportation challenges. There are, I, as I understand it from Chris Arnett, is transportation really became the reason why many of these tickets were being issued. Yeah, if, for being or late family, on a bus. Yeah, family yeah. units. Right. Explain that because that becomes even more daunting. Right, right. So um, there is those issues of getting to school on time, of people working late night shifts, multiple shifts at work and not being able to drop their kids off or maybe running late because they were caught up at work, th things of that nature. But I think what's important and what we have to look at is the, the reason or rationale why was this program put in place uh, during the time it was put in place. Is the program still working? Is it still in place from now? So the, they, the, the city council had made an amendment to change the, the harshness of it. It's still mm -hmm. in place. Um, but prior, um, on the third offense, it was up to $900 or more for, for a ticket. That has changed, um, but th the program nonetheless is. So what's, what's the answer? I mean, what's the solution? In, in one minute or less, I mean, yeah. what can we do to kind of get our handle around this problem and try to effectuate positive change? So I think there's three things. So the first thing is that uh, we have to undo the heavy reliance upon testing, mm. standardized testing, because that has completely siphoned away money from other programs that will keep That students. could be a whole other conversation. That's a whole other yeah, conversation, yeah. right? Uh, but we have to look at why kids are not going to school in the first place. Mm -hmm. A lot of it because there, there's no buy-in to the school apparatus. And programs are being cut left and right. There's lots of money in education, but where that money is going. Mm -hmm. The second thing is you have to re remove police from schools because... Mm, that's controversial. <laughs> it is. It is. But uh, schools have gotten worse as more police have, have mm. come in. And third? And the, the third thing is that you have to get the control of schools by the very people and the parents and the community from, what, from whence they come. And that's not happening right now. Okay, Professor, I thank you so much for joining us. His name is Damien Sojourner. He's a professor at Scripps College. My name is Brad Palmer. This is Charter California Edition.